I first I started this about 18 months ago and I remember it when I interviewed Tabitha from Cod Close and, and I saw you commented on the interview and I was I had to double check say who's well, this sounds familiar and stuff <laughs> and so it so I've been trying to grab get you on the show for almost a year and a half oh, you've, been, you've been so consistent <laughs> I was like you know let me just let me talk to this man because he's really been patient and yeah. so, you know I appreciate your patience sometimes you gotta just you can't just rush and do things right away yeah, no, no, it's totally understandable, and I, and I think over the year, over the time, I've actually had you know a different appreciation. And as I said, I checked out the interview you did with I don't know who the guy is, but you were talking about the mental health stuff. So when I'm not doing this, I'm a therapist, so I, and I, my club patients mm -hmm. are under nineteen, so I work with the young kids, and and so mental health was the reason I started this was a way of talking, just help people hearing inspirational stories. Really. Uh, yeah, this is why I started this, but, you know, to, so we can hear from people that are famous, hear their stories and their journeys and get inspiration. And so, but it has grown to where we're focusing on, on, on R&B artists, but it's the mm -hmm. same journey. Um, every, you know, everyone has had the ups and downs. Yeah, is it that we're probably the ones that meet that need the most therapy. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I don't, you know. Right, it's, it's, it's something, it, it's like the correlation between mental health and, and, and creative people. I don't know what it is, but we definitely can use some therapy for sure. Yeah, no, but I, I think if we start, I guess it's, you know, I always say we have an international audience and, and it's always good to always go to where you, you're born and raised because no, everyone might know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know that's that's a whole other topic. Honey. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But but where were you? Where were you born and and, and raised? Are we are we live? Are we filming? Oh, yeah, we can start. No, we're going to start now. Yeah, we can. We can oh, start. Okay. Uh, well, I was I was born and raised in New York, New York. I'm well. I was born in Harlem. Wow. In Harlem, New York. But you know, I went from Harlem Hospital to the Bronx. <laughs> My goodness. So I grew up in the Bronx. Yeah. So, so many of the artists, R&B artists that we, we talk to, they, they all seem to be more on the South and, and stuff, but not many, apart from the uh, hip-hop stars, are from New York. But what was it like growing up in New York back, back in the day? New York was fun. You know, I, when people ask me that, I always look at New York as it, it has always been, and I can say that now that I'm older, but it's always been like a boot camp. New York actually will make you tough. And I tell my nieces and nephews today who wasn't born there, I say, y'all need a little bit of New York. Y'all should have come <laughs> to New York. Because these kids nowadays, they can't do nothing. They lazy, you know. But we had, we had a good time. We walked to the bus. We walked once, sometimes two, two miles to catch the train, you know. But it was all wow. about fun think about money you know because half of us didn't really have anything to compare it to we didn't have any money you know we we didn't have like real role models growing up all the time you know so it was just we were just happy being kids wow. and, and then when it comes to I mean growing up in, in those times because I remember speaking to Tam, interviewing Tammy Lucas and she was talking to me about the music <laughs> scene Tammy Lucas <laughs> yeah oh uh, my uh, Miss Tammy Lucas. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I know she did um, um, use your heart with, with the Neptunes with you with you guys, but she, yes, yeah, she did. Yeah, yeah she, but I remember when we when I spoke interviewed her, she, she talked about how lovely it was growing up in New York. The music, you know, everyone was out, and, and it was just the, the sort of the vibe and stuff. But even Harlem was the Apollo. Was it still famous back then when you grown up in Harlem? Was, did you realize how popular it was? Oh, absolutely. Um, Showtime at the Apollo. Well, it wasn't Showtime at the Apollo at the time. That's when it um, transitioned to television. But it was um, Amateur Night at the Apollo. And that was like the big thing for anybody who was inspired to, to be a singer or a musician of some sort. Um, yes, absolutely. I, 
actually, my mom used to take me there every Wednesday, and I believe the cheapest ticket was twelve dollars, and and the higher ticket price was twenty five. So. For some reason, we always found a way to get that $12. And my mom would take me there every week and she would say, are you ready? And I was like, no, because that that crowd is so brutal. Wow. If you've never been to Amateur Night at the Apollo, like if you're whack, they will tell you. And that's just New York, period. Wow. If you're garbage, they don't care. Eight to 80 blind crippled crazy. <laughs> If you're whack, they're going to throw you off stage. So with, with the Sandman. Yeah, the Sandman. So after about maybe 10 visits to the Apollo Theater, my mom asked me, she said, are you ready to, you know, for amateur night? I said, no, I don't ever think I'm going to be ready. Oh, to actually perform or to just. Yeah, to do amateur night at the Apollo. Oh. And I was scared because of that audience was brutal. And my mom said to me, are you ready? And I said, no, mom, I'm not ready. Mm -hmm. And I said, I don't ever think I'm going to be ready. When I come on this stage, I'm going to be a guest. So I spoke into my own life. Wow. <laughs> and it happened. Yeah. How old were you then? Around with that when that, that's... I, was about, I was about 12. 11, 12. Did, did you already have the... the, the passion to sing or what, what was it what, what? that passion I had that passion um since I was a little kid and I would tell uh, my grandbaby today I'm like you know when I was young I, I kind of felt connected to entertainment of all kind like I used to love watching the Miss America contest <laughs> you know just to see the talent portion of the show okay. and uh, you know while Kids my age were buying ice cream. Whenever I got a hold of some money, I was buying records, 45s. Wow. Who were, who were you into? Who were, who, which, which artists were you um, inspired by, Ben, back then? Oh, my God. Um, well, I grew up listening to blues. My mom um, played a lot of blues. Um, Sam Cooke, Otis Redding, um, uh, Bobby Womack played in my house, wow. Teddy Bass, but... The person who really inspired me when I was little, little, have to be Stacy Lattisaw. I don't know her. Oh, oh my God. Yes, Stacy Lattisaw, um, the Dream Girls, the original Dream Girls soundtrack, Jennifer Holiday was a big influence. Stephanie Mills, of course. Wow. And there was a young lady. Um, they used to do this off-Broadway play called Mama I Want to Sing. And her name was Desiree Coleman. But now she's Kadish Coleman. Her name is like really <laughs> weird. But her, I knew her as Desiree Coleman Jackson. She was married to um, Mark Jackson, a basketball player who's now a coach. And she was in this play called Mama I Want to Sing. And I believe she was about 16. And I was probably 10 or nine. And I used to look at her like she was so beautiful back then with this huge voice. Wow. And I was, oh my God, like she had like this beautiful falsetto voice that just kind of carried, like she would go into her falsetto voice and then to her big voice. And I'm like, wow, <laughs> I was so like amazed at that, but, um, Definitely a, a lot of people inspired me. And my brother, my brother was like a singer singer. Like he actually did a lot of quartet. Oh. And I he inspired me a lot too. And he never even knew it. Wow. I mean, but but back back then you, you have these artists who because I I grew up loving Michael Jackson and the, and the, but I never oh. thought I'd ever sing. But I'm wondering. <laughs> Being inspired by them and, and already speaking into your life about being a, a guest on the Apollo, where was the opportunity to actually sing and learn how learn the craft back in those early days? Well, well, in school, in school okay. and at home, you know, we had a lot of um, like talent programs. We had, you know, the Glee Club. We had a band class. We had talent shows in our school. And I've noticed they don't have a lot of that stuff, a lot of creative stuff going on now. Um, but that really, really helped me a whole lot, you know, as far as 
being on stage and and not being afraid of the stage because the stage can be a very scary place to be. Yeah. You know, everybody think it's easy. And even when you're a seasoned artist, it's still, it's scary. But yeah. in, in the strangest way, it's so scary, but it's your comfort zone. Wow. Those people in the audience, they scare you a little bit, but those are the same people that give you so much comfort. Wow. Yeah. So. But I wonder how much that is inspired by seeing the Apollo and seeing the crowd and seeing how the artists, you know, you know, have to be at the best and, and probably, you know, almost thinking that that could happen at any time. Well, back then, because that audience was so cruel, <laughs> I know the older I got, I know, I'm like, you know, they would really love the Sopranos. Like, you can be like, the worst singer, but if you <laughs> up in the strap, yeah. or if you hit like a soprano note they like Woo! Woo! you know <laughs> I'm like it's not me they they toned them they don't know what they talk about <laughs> they just was loving the bigger voices so okay they, you know, okay it's okay <laughs> that really taught me that everybody is just not gonna like you yeah so that prepared me for the world. Mm. I, 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 and I'm wondering, because when, you, when you, you're growing up, I mean, did being a recording artist ever seem achievable? Because, you know, it's not like, you know, in the 90s we had young groups like, you know, The Boys or High Five. Mm. So we, you, you could think, oh, if they can make it, we can make it. But back when you were coming up, you know, you know, Motown seemed quite a distance. I mean, the Jacksons, I mean, I don't know who you would have thought how the dream of being an artist would have ever seen realistic back in those days. What were you, who, who did you look at and think, if they could do it, I could do it? Um, it was Shanice Wilson. And back then, Shanice Wilson didn't even have a deal. She was just doing star search. Like she was trying to do it just like we were. But she was definitely my inspiration as far as seeing somebody visually yeah. and saying, wow, man, if, if, if she could do that, I know I could do this. You know, so I followed her career and she was probably, her and Stacey Lattiso was probably the two of the youngest talented singers who had record deals so young yeah you know so if i had to choose anybody it would have been shanice wilson wow <laughs> yeah okay i mean before she even came about then did you did you have an idea of what you wanted to do then did you think about becoming because these are solo artists you spoke about were you thinking about doing it till going alone and stuff or what was that journey but it didn't matter how it happened I, you know I never really felt like it did it wasn't gonna happen in the yeah. strangest way I never really felt like it wasn't gonna happen um oh my god this <laughs> is oh my god that's, that's why I said it <laughs> I put my phone on do not disturb. <laughs> my fine. phone has not rang all day. <laughs> now, fine. today it wants to. So, how do I do this if it's on do not disturb? <laughs> <Don't worry. laughs> so, but you were saying that, uh, that you never, th yeah, you always thought, you always knew. I always felt like it was going to happen one way or the other. Like, um, I used to love groups like the Jones Girls. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Motions. Of course, like the Clark Sisters. But I was so young listening to the Clark Sisters. I didn't really understand that kind of singing because mm. I, I, I went to church, but I wasn't like the church girl who, who parents made you go to church for five days a week. You know, I just... <laughs> Because, you know, I wanted to do something that day on a Sunday with my aunt. Yeah. And I begged her to let me go to church with her. So, wow. so I ended up there. But it had to be like the, like the Jones girls, the emotions. And then it was a group called the Jets. 
it was a group called um oh my god i love the oj's okay i yeah. love a lot of those krona the temptations of course i mean how can you even inspire to do this thing without loving those those older bands you know but then watching those older bands did you did you initially think i want to form a group or did you not think being a solo artist on stage by yourself well i always wanted to do a group oh wow i always uh, because my mom had me all over the place like i was singing school and in middle school and it just seemed to be more fun like you know in middle school we had like these talent shows or whatever and then they, they would always pair like three people together okay. you know or people over here one person over there and it was just so much fun and you know we're doing rehearsals and stuff like that so yeah i, I would say that you know wow that's always strange because I, i always would assume everyone would want to be their own star their own person and 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 unless you had good you would grow up with friends who could sing and you kind of came together i i, I wouldn't have thought that would have been not a priority but that would have been a sense of this is how i wanted to go well that's of course that's how it happened but i i don't i think it's it's a it's all a matter of what you want out of it i never really wanted to be a star okay. i didn't look at it for that reason i my motivation was i didn't want to be poor anymore <laughs> I, you know, i wanted to do something for my mom like i wanted to change my situation and plus wow. I was young you know I I was a teen parent so that was my my fire to wow. want to do something that would make people forget about the fact that I was even a teen parent you know because where I'm from you know they looked at me crazy and I felt bad like I felt bad I felt like a disappointment to my mom and my family mm -hmm. and to myself so I was I just wanted to do something that made everybody happy and proud. Wow. Yeah, cuz I I I I cuz I went to your site and I saw and I know that you you you've got a you've been promoting teen pregnancy. Um I I didn't realize that you you said you had two children by 17. Um so even before you started the group and and and, and I do wonder how supportive your mom might have been in in not being disappointed but saying okay I'm going to support encourage you as you're doing uh, pursuing your music career how was that for you it was amazing my mom was everything like she always supported now when before SWV I I used to sing with this group called the Diva Girls <laughs> I don't know I don't know where they are but I was actually the lead singer of the Diva Girls, right? But my mom and we did like this um this snapple jingle. I don't know what happened to it. I don't know. I just don't know, but that was like the first studio experience I I ever had and um my mom has always been there. She's wow. always been my champion. She's always said you're going to do amazing. Like I was just always amazing to my mom. She just always just supported me, you know. She she wanted her baby girl. She saw the vision, she saw the dream. She she saw what I wanted to do. I mean a lot of people would you know I've even spoken to artists who whose parents wanted to create have a, a career but when they had the kid they had them they put it on the back burner. You were the opposite. I mean, you had two young children at 17 but still were pursuing a career. I, I what was the drive and because that's that's a story in itself. But how did you not see having children at a young age by yourself as a hindrance in order to pursue a career that is a challenge to get in on the best of days? Well, I I'm going to just put this out here like I am not by any way promoting teen pregnancy um because every story is not always the same mm. did I have challenges absolutely i will never sit here and say oh my god you know i have my children you know and and i have now i have this fabulous career it was nothing like that 
I spent a lot of days crying, wanting to be with my kids. And I, I couldn't, I had obligations, but I knew that those obligations would give us a better life. Mm -hmm. So I had to choose. When you talk about sacrifice, this industry is a sacrifice. Mm -hmm. It's a sacrifice. Like you lose one thing to gain something else, but you need both. So you have to figure out how to balance. I was a Western Union mom. I would talk to my kids on the phone all the, all the time. I would send letters. I would send cards. You know, um, I would do last minute pop-up visits for one day or a few hours just to see my kids, you know? But wow. I'm so thankful, like I had the crazy support system. Mm -hmm. Like my mom and my sisters held me down because had it not been for them, I probably wouldn't have been able to do what I'm doing. Yeah. Did, did, was there any time before you, you formed SW that you, you that you ever thought, Maybe, maybe not. Maybe I just get a job at a grocery store and raise my kids. Or was there any of okay. I never felt that. Once I felt like it was happening for real, and it just happened so fast, I was like, oh, no, I, I went on running. It wasn't until I got into the situation, I felt like that. <laughs> okay, okay. But because now I had something to compare it to. Like, you know, okay, so I'm living in the Bronx. I'm growing up. I got two kids at 17 years old. And I got this career. I'm able to go on the road, make a few dollars, take care of my kids, pay some bills. But it's like, I didn't really understand business and how it works and how lonely the road is. Like, the road is a lonely place. Mm -hmm. It's very lonely. And I spent a lot of my years lonely and crying, you know, because I felt like I, there was a point where I felt like I didn't make the right decision. Mm -hmm. um, wow. But then I have to, you know, it's emotional, you know, when you're used to, I'm, I'm very close to my family. Like we've always been close. So when you get on the road and it's like, oh my God, you do a show and you go in your hotel room, you're, you're by yourself every, all the time. Yeah. So I think one of the things that we as fans have learned over the past year and a half is that you guys didn't always live the glamorous life. You didn't. You weren't making make millions of dollars, even though the videos look rich. And I think it's been a real eye opening for us to, to say, "Wow, it's it wasn't all that great." I mean, because the videos and the music always gives us an image of happiness and like, "Wow, look at these guys." we shocked when we saw TLC and like, well, what's going on? How could they be broke? But I think we're hearing more and more of this. But before we get there, though, I, I guess everyone would say, okay, you're part of the, is it the Diva Girls, you said? Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. And then that, that sort of didn't work. And then how did Taj and Coco sort of pop in into your life? <sighs> well, uh, the, the short version, um, I, it was just as simple as me calling uh, Cheryl Coco to and ask her, "Yo, you want to join? You want to do a group?" Oh, but you know? uh, did you know her for something before? Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. I've, okay. I've known her for a long time, so um, it was just that simple. You want to start a group, and she didn't think I was serious about it, and she's like, "Ah, you call me back when you're serious." And I, I was serious. So um, I don't know if it's because I had the kids. She didn't think I was serious. Uh, but, okay. But I um, actually I only had one kid when I when I asked her this. I, you know what? The group was started. We started singing together before I had the kids. Wow. Yeah. So they they've seen a lot. <laughs> 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 but I can't give you everything because you have to save something for the biopic yeah no definitely 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 no, understandable but but so you grew up close to cheryl or coco and, and what about Taj? was she also in the, the close by yeah she was actually um she was a uh, cheryl's friend okay and a friend of cheryl's her name was amy and um they actually found Taj. From Brooklyn, yeah. Okay. Was it the intention just to have three people? Or did you not want four like in Vogue? Or did you, what was... 
it. There's a whole story. We were so many different names. We were um, the Four Shades of Rhythm. We were, and that was four of us. Okay, it was four. And we went from four, like three, probably two or three sets of four different groups with different names. And um, once we was like really, really serious and working with a real producer in a real studio, we named ourselves TLC. Uh -huh. That didn't turn out right. <laughs> I mean, we got to cease and desist so fast. <laughs> You will not be that name. So, um, you know, so, and if anybody don't know, like, those are our initials, whether you say uh, Todd, Todd Levy and Coco, um, Joe, like, those were really our initials. So, um, yeah, so we kind of landed with Sisters with Voices, SWV. Uh, the, uh, whose idea was it? Our manager at the time, Maureen Singleton. What did you think of the name? Terrible. It's, <laughs> that name sounded so dumb. It sounds <laughs> to me today. Sister Voices. Like it sounds like it sounds how it sounded to us back then, like like a choir or <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Organization or something <laughs> like so. I SWV definitely have more swag to it. <laughs> Whose idea was it to switch it to SWV? I think it was ours. It's just something that kind of happened. Because BBD was out. We was like, oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. UB. Yeah, so, um, you know, things just happen, like, so spontaneously. But, yeah. One of the things that we've all learned um, is about talented artists gets signed, um, a lawyer shows up with a contract and it's like, oh, that's, that's good, you sign off and then you just go ahead and think. And then, there are, you know, and of course, we're learning that, um, we're learning that, that how you can sign off and weigh everything without recognizing until later on. How was it for you guys? Were you just, you know, so excited when you, you got the opportunity with RCA that, that you didn't even, you know, did your lawyer was, did you have a good lawyer to support you and explain the ins and outs? <laughs> no, absolutely. Um, I wouldn't say that excited. Yeah, we were excited and we were just young. We didn't know the questions to ask. We had adult people working with us. So when you're young, you just know to respect the adults. You know, they know a little more and they're going to take care of you. But it doesn't happen when in the music business, you know, it's almost like a lot of people want you to be dumb. They want you to be stupid. They don't want you to be because as soon as you get smart, you become a problem. That's what I mean, Heron, yeah. Become difficult. You ask one question, it's like, <laughs> oh, she's on my shit now, you know, let me get rid of her. Wow. And then all crazy rumors start and nobody like you anymore. But as long as you shut up and you're quiet, and, and you're dumb, oh yeah, they love it. Wow. <laughs> but um, we just didn't have the knowledge. We didn't have the people to kind of usher us into the situation and teach us. We didn't have teachers. We had a lot of people that just kind of ate off of us. Wow. And we learned by trial and error. So is that when, because you said being on the road was lonely, but at that point when you were on the road and having to do promotional tours, the was it the hardest part before you know the album is out is that is that the hardest part or is it after the album is out and everyone knows you oh my gosh it's so funny that you asked me that because i think of how these artists are today and how disrespectful they are to artists like us like the older seasoned artists and they'd be so quick to say old school, and, and that's fine. But I, I, I look at that now as a badge of honor because it's great. That means that I've been here before. Mm -hmm. So I, I have a certain level of respect for that, but they have, they've not even built to do the legwork that we've done. 
this was before social media. We had to sit down at a chair. We had what they would call a promo day mm. where we probably get to eat twice. We sit down at a table and we around a whole bunch of media doing interviews, interviews, interviews. I mean, sometimes you do like 50 interviews in one day. Wow. And just sitting there, some of them are phoners, some of them are, are live, you know, but it's yeah. not like this. It's more of their present. Yeah, yeah. And a lot of these artists are not built to do that, yeah. you know. So absolutely, like, it, it was a lot tougher back then. Did you question the choices you made? Or were you still like, this is my dream, Apollo, I'm ready for you, San what, what What kept you saying i'm not gonna stop you mean at, at what point those early days because as i said that doesn't sound fun sitting down and, and, I, and i know i've heard from uptown when they were telling me that back in days you had promo tours radios you had to go do all this stuff and and said from bus and you haven't made any sold any records so of course that the, the, the budget will be limited on on, on what they're going to spend for you well, see, we were, um, we had what you call per diem. They would give us like maybe $75 a day to eat and stuff. And we were kids. We was like, $75 a day? This is pretty cool. <laughs> I'm only going to spend $10 on food. So <laughs> but I, I never, not at that time, because it, it was a lot of fun. I enjoyed doing the interviews. It was tiring. You yeah. know, you got tired. I mean, anybody would get burnt out. But it was still a lot of fun. You know, the fact that people wanted to know anything about you is attractive. Like, mm. you know, it's appealing. So um, it, it was fun. I had a good time. And we had some amazing reps at RCA. Like, we had some really good people that worked for the record company. You know, um, like Mary Moore, rest in peace. She was so amazing. She was our publicist and... You know, we had some really pretty dope people that worked the record. And um, we actually was able to see them work the record. Like, we had to literally go to the radio stations. Yeah, okay, back in those days. We had to really do the work, you know. And a lot of these artists are not built for that today. Yeah, no, it's it's a lot different. I didn't realize that right, um, right here um, was your first single because um, by the time you guys came out, I, I just I went to college in Alabama and then moved to the UK for about a couple of months before moving back to to, to Wisconsin. And but I'm so into you was the one that sort of was on the radio, especially the remix. But mm -hmm. when you guys were recording the, the your first album, did you did you think about the who was out and think, okay, because as I said, back then you had a lot of New Jack, you know, the good girls, um, um, the girls, um, then you had In Vogue doing what, what they were doing. Um, and I'm trying to think who else might've been out when you guys, just before you guys came out as a there group. Was a I, group called Ex-Girlfriend. Ex-Girlfriend, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, there was a few of them. Um, a Brownstone was out. No. You had... Not as no. early as you guys. They came oh, out. Right. Right, right, right. But ex girlfriend definitely yeah. was out because we have made this. Oh I <laughs> can't tell you this. This gotta this gotta wait for the bio. Ah. <laughs> but then there was another girl group that was on Uptown called The Girls. Yeah, the girls, yeah, we know them. I'll be sure it was, yeah. <laughs> My guy, like we thought they were just super dope, you know. Uh, do you know Tammy was actually supposed to be in? Um, uh, I think the girls, Tammy Lucas. Yeah, she 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 was she was supposed to be in it, uh, but I think she read the contract <laughs> and she said, no, "I'm not, not you're not going to get me that way." So she stuck to being a writer. <laughs> well, good, good job. <laughs> but so you, you know, and, and I've, I've spoken at length with with Brian, and he talked about you know how the the music and everything. But when you guys were recording um, some of the songs, did you notice that, oh, okay, this sounds good. It sounds different than what was on the radio and that we could actually, you know, make a, make a dent? Or did you just, what was it like? 
Well, first of all, um, I think every song, when you, you already know what song you're going to record when you hear it. When Brian's songs were brought to us, it was just like magic. One thing you cannot take from that, brother, is that, <laughs> yo, <laughs> Brian is talented. And back then, I think he was doing a lot of club stuff and um, house music because he loves house music. <laughs> like, he's a connoisseur. And to see how he can do a house track and, and then transition into, like, this deep R&B stuff, I was like, wow. You know, because usually producers are just one way. Yeah. They can wait at this and that's it. But I mean, when we heard Brian's stuff, it was just like a no brainer. It, it was magic. I mean, you can pretty much see. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but know? how how much and I and I don't know when you guys before you got signed with RCA, did you guys went to perform? Was it always Cheryl singing lead and, and, and the rest of you um, doing the backgrounds, or did you guys mix around in, in, with different songs prior to being signed? Well, no, it, it wasn't like that. It was like that when we finally got the deal. Like, and even like demo wise, we were all just kind of collaborate. But Jodeci was out. Okay, yeah, yeah. Jodeci was out. And it was just a lot of dope singers. Guy was hot. Yeah. And everybody was, everybody was singing like with that churchy sound. Yeah. So it just made sense. It just made sense. It didn't help us any, but I mean, <laughs> it did, but I'm just saying like, you know, for people to walk around and think you just have no talent or whatever, that's like a bad feeling, but you know, it worked. It was it was how it was supposed to be at the time, and that was that. Yeah, I, I can't really. I mean, I can't answer it from a pro, a producer standpoint or the record label standpoint, but I can tell you um, from my perspective. Yeah, as I said, I've um, I, I know I know it had um, reservations with intro and I love body and, and intro um, um same thing with cut close even um not guy because they did mix it around a little bit teddy and aaron with, with sheer stuff but i that my worry and fear was always if the lead singer you know loses the voice or you know like tony in high five it makes everyone else vulnerable and but then I and I do, but I do wonder though in those early days is that if they just said, "Yep, we just want to have Cheryl sing and stuff," they's like, "Wow, we're just in the studio." Do you in those the first album? I'm thinking, do you then question, or you're just like, "Wow, we're just in recording studio," and it doesn't even you don't consider think about it? I don't even think they was thinking that far ahead because record companies don't care. Mm -hmm. They don't care. They don't care how something uh, makes you feel. They don't care about your emotions. They don't care about how people are gonna look at you or how you know their decision is gonna affect the brand as a whole. They don't care. They just about making a record and making it great and making money. That's yeah. what it was. No one gives a damn about you. Hmm. No. But how did how was it for you? Because I think a lot of it is, you know, when we're reflecting, is I, I have no idea what it what it'd be like for yourself then, because we all know that you guys are all individual singers, so you wouldn't just just be the background singer. But what was it like? How did you manage? How did you balance and not actually you sh think Cheryl was the vil the the villain, you know, make her the villain? How how did you manage that, especially being young? Oh, I didn't think she was the villain. Why? Why you say that? No, 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 no. I'm not saying. You know how it is when if 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 someone gets the spotlight, and, and as I said, I'm how it can be easy 
this is what I think. I think it, it, it determines how bad you want. You got to figure out when you're in a situation and you come in as a team, you have to figure out what is it that you want to get out of this? Mm. You know, for me, it was never about spotlight. It was never about I wanted to be the famous one. Mm. I just wanted to do something that worked for the three of us. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Like it's it's not and it's not even about that with me now. Like I'm barely on social media. I barely know how to work an iPhone. You know what I'm saying? Like it's not about that for me. I'm not out there, you know, taking bikini pics and photos all over the place. I don't care. Mm -hmm. That's not what it's about for me today. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? But um, you know, the sad part about it is that the audience, they they gain a perception of who they think you are based on what we show them. And that's been a story, you know, so it's too late to change it now. Yeah. <laughs> no, but then because we if um because I, as I said, it's I used my favorite show used to be behind the music on VH1, and and a lot of times um, bands, especially rock bands, would break up because the lead the lead singer probably wrote all the songs and and or, or something like that or spotlight. But um, it's important to hear that you know back in those days, I guess you guys saw the bigger picture, and 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 knew that you know being one despite everything was probably the best way to succeed i will say this you cannot help when you're amazing okay i knew she was amazing that's why i called her so when you it's just when you get in this business mm. people try to sow these seeds of discord yeah. and try to make it seem like it's something that is really not you know what I mean? Yeah. I will put Miss Cheryl Elizabeth Gamble next to the best of them. Okay. It is almost 30 years later, and I still feel that way. Mm -hmm. What she presented, what she gave was amazing. Mm -hmm. And I still do things that's amazing. I just wanted an opportunity to be amazing. Mm. You understand? Yeah. But no one nurtured my amazing. No one nurtured my gift. You know what I mean? Yeah. So you start to doubt yourself. You start to something that you've been doing forever that you've always been confident doing. You all, all of a sudden come into this space where no one even cares. Mm -hmm. So you grow up. And you realize that you can't always wait for people to tell you that you're amazing. You have to feel it. You have to believe it. You know, and today, nobody can tell me shit. Mm. I am fucking amazing. Mm. Period. Mm. Yeah, you know, it's interesting what you said because I mentioned as a therapist and I work predominantly with under 19s and, and a lot of the girls struggle with self-esteem and self-value um, and even if their family say oh you're beautiful and amazing it's because they, they, they compare themselves to others it's hard to believe that and that's where we struggle with depression self-harm and, and things like that and I, and I do wonder when you are on the road you're away from your family who have been a bedrock for you how 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 hard was it for you as a recording artist in those very early days then not being able to showcase yourself and and and, um, and manage just your general well-being in those early 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 recording days well one thing about the stage is that even today i show up <laughs> i am present if I'm not there on that stage with my group, you will know that I'm not there. Mm. So I find comfort in that. You will definitely miss me on that stage. You know what I mean? Yeah. But I think we rely too much on people for validation. Yeah. Um, back in the day, I didn't understand what it meant to create your own environment. That sometimes, you know, when you're a young girl going into this adult world, 
there's a lot of things they're not going to teach you. They're not going to tell you. They don't want you to know. They want you to be sad. They want you to be miserable. Mm -hmm. And sometimes people just kind of, they kind of become leeches to that. Like that, you, you ever been in a situation where people just, they wake up thinking about how they're going to disrupt your life or make you feel bad or make your, your, your self-esteem low? We deal with that all the time today, you know, and I allow the enemy to penetrate my heart and my soul with negative stuff to the point that I started believing this stuff about myself. And it takes for you to grow up and to um, be in your own space and be delivered from people mm -hmm. because people will have you wanting to commit suicide. They will, they, they will have you wanting to take yourself out. And I was all of those places at one time wow. because of people. Today, totally different. When I made the decision that I was gonna live my life and I was gonna choose life over death, that's what the hell I meant. I was gonna stand. I was going to battle anybody that I had to battle. And I wasn't going to be the quiet, timid girl anymore. The stupid girl. I'm not going to, I'm not her. I'm not her anymore. You know? So sometimes you have to create your own peace. You know? And sometimes creating that peace means that you have to, you have to pull yourself away from, from certain people. And sometimes you got to pull yourself away from this industry industry is is not for everybody mm -hmm. the fans people who support you those people in those seats they make your heart happy mm -hmm. they don't know nothing that's going on behind the scenes they have mm -hmm. no idea how before you got on that stage you was in tears crying they don't know but when you go out there and you, you see them wanting to shake your hand and just, you know, slow dancing to songs and just doing all of this stuff and showing you how dope you are. It makes it all possible. Mm -hmm. It makes it easier. Yeah. No, you, you, you are right. And, and we're learning, you know, we're learning. We never, you know, we see guys singing, smiling, all the pitches in black beat and right on you guys all smiling and, and telling us all the good <laughs> stuff. So, how on Jet Magazine, so how are we supposed to see anything outside? Because if, if we saw the sad side, it would, won't be a successful commodity for the record labels. Mm -hmm. the, um, but don't, don't get me wrong. Like, you know, every, everybody's story is not the same. You know what I mean? And I think I, what we do is no different than what people do when they go to their job every day. Sometimes you just don't want to show up for work. Sometimes you get tired. It's just in our business, we're dealing with so many more people. Yeah. We're taking so many other hands. Like we have to, we're, we're contractually obligated to show up for work. And sometimes, you know, it could be a death in a family two days before. Like, you know, you, you still have to show up. You know? Yeah. But, but it's not just that. I remember talking to Cassandra Lucas from Chain Your Faces and, and it was very much of a, we compared a recording artist to say an NBA player or NFL player. You both have talent, but the NFL player or NBA player is paid a big contract and protected because they know how valuable an asset they are. While as a recording artist, they're taking every penny they can from you and instead of trying to enhance and, and protect the asset, they're almost stripping it out just in case it loses value so quickly. And, and it was hard for us, for me, as a fan from the outside to understand why labels didn't have the same type of approach to say, these are, perf perf art, these are valuable assets that we're working with. We need to make sure that they're paid well and looked after, you know, long-term health insurance and all, all of that. Um, it's hard for us as fans. That's not their job. That's not, that's not their job. When you sign a contract, you're self-employed now. It's not their job to make sure that you have health insurance. It's not their job to make sure you understand 
the contract that you're signing. It's not their job that um, they don't, it's not their job to make sure that you show up for work. Like these are things that come along with everything that you're doing. Like this is the life that you chose. And a lot of stuff is trial and error. You don't know you do wrong unless you do right. You don't know you're doing right unless you do wrong. Hmm. You don't know how to do right unless you do wrong. Because people will remind you of all the wrong shit you've done. <laughs> wow. Mind you, but um, it's definitely not an industry that protects you. You know, and that's why you see a lot of clicks. You see a lot of people latching on to other people. You know, the certain people, you see a lot of the same people congregating together. They do everything together because you have to have that to sustain yourself. That's mm -hmm. where your protection comes from, people that you know. Yeah. You know? <laughs> wow. As far as the exciting parts was, you know, there's a difference between how the 90s was for us compared to, say, the 80s and 70s or even the 2000s. You came out 92, 93, just at the epicenter of when the 90s were just at its, at its peak. You had, you know, you, met, you mentioned Jodeci, you know, Mary was blowing up. Um, Jade came out with Don't Walk Away, you know, Brown. So all these groups were, were coming out and it was, everyone was difference you know there was it's not you know no copycats you know uh, there was no you you can knew every artist every song you can like you know we could celebrate everyone as an artist back then with all these amazing other groups solos and and groups how was it like did you feel like you're in competition did you feel like we need to show up because jade or in Vogue's, you know what, what was it like back in those early days Absolutely. It's always about friendly competition. Like we were fans of, and still are, fans of all of those groups. But if we on the bill together, you know, <laughs> I was one job to do, and that's the bus they had. <laughs> I mean, and I'm sure they felt the same way or whatever, but it, it's all in love. It's all like, oh shit, they killed. We got to go out there and smash. So it's always, you know, that friendly competition for sure. But did you know that it was a lot of, you know, I mean, look at the industry now, but there was so much competition, so many groups, they were all doing great things. Did you feel the pressure about how to get to number one and, and stuff like that? Did, did you? No. Now, that's the one thing my record company did. Like, they worked a lot of our records, and we never really had that, that kind of pressure. We didn't know that the record was going to just do crazy numbers. Mm. We had, there's just one day, you know, we did a video and we were going, I know I would go to my godmother's house in the Bronx. And then the next time the record came out, the video was out. And then they, they everybody saw that I was at my godmother's house, people banging on the door. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is something else. So it just kind of changed and, but it, it, it changed for the better. Like I, I, I wouldn't trade that for anything because it, it really taught me how to be humble. It taught me that people don't have to like you mm. and they don't have to love you. So if, when I meet people who are not SWB fans, I don't take that personal. Are there not when, people that are not SWB fans? I didn't realize. Oh, like, because Everybody don't like us. Okay. That's... You know, for whatever reason. I mean, they, they, you know, somebody don't have to like you for their own little reasons. It could be something so dumb. Or they just may not be into your kind of music. And you have to respect that. Mm -hmm. Everybody is not going to like you and love you. And that's why a lot of these young artists that come up today and I speak to them and stuff. And I say, you know, whether your music is going to attract them. When you go into somebody's presence, you just make sure they like something about you. Mm. Because that something about you can make them like everything about you. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, that's a lot, even, even to me, because, I don't know, people just have this perception of me. I could turn it on and off, <laughs> but they meet me. It's always fun. It's always a good time. They're like, oh, my God, I fuck with you. 
with you. You have a good time. <laughs> but that's just me. Like, you know, I just feel like I just want everybody to just have a good time and, and do some shit talking and just, just have fun. You know, we all been miserable. I know I made a vow. I done cried my last <laughs> yesterday. <laughs> I'm not doing all that crying shit no more. I'm not because I have so much more to be thankful for. Yeah. You know, like my present is so amazing right now. My my today, my current yeah. is so amazing to me. So I have a lot to celebrate, even like outside of how people know me. Mm. You know? Yeah. I know the reputation is oh Lily, she, she, she's always a straight talker and stuff. So. <laughs> I'm a shit talker all day. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I am, but it's, you know, it's, it's 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 cool. That's just my personality, you know. And people just, I love for people to be themselves, you mm. know. Because all day we spend time. At, uh, I'm like people that we know. They're corporate people, and they go to church and they they put on. Yeah what people see about them is not even who they are. It's who they think they should have to be in front of people. And mm. why should you have to be somebody other than who you are? Yeah. You yeah. Know? And, and as I said, in your industry, it's, it's very, very different from, you know, we're day to day. No, you know, we can almost be as genuine as we, as we need to be, but in, in the industry you're in, you're, you're probably used to people who are too faced and stuff, but, I, I, how was it like when you first heard yourself on the radio? Because we've seen different buy-offs and like even uh, Salt and Pepper or New Edition when they're listening to themselves on the radio for the first time. Can you remember when you first heard? I remember very clearly. We was in LA on a promo tour. <sighs> we were in a limo coming from the airport and I LA knew came. <laughs> so we sticking our head out the window. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just amazing because you you really you you put in a lot of work in the studio it's a lot of long hours a lot of sacrificing and now you you put yourself in a position to finally see if this thing is going to work or not yeah you know and thank god you know it did it did i've i've been blessed to work with two amazing women you know right, wrong, and indifferent, we did some dope shit. You yeah. know what I'm saying? That dope shit, nobody can take away from us because we all were there. Yeah. You know? So, um, one thing I love about um, SWV is that we always vowed that we will always keep our, our same three members. And regardless of when we were going through our transition and we was doing a little petty stuff, the petty fighting when we came back we came back as three girls who started this thing and that, to me that's what it's all about yeah you know i mean and you know thank god none of nothing is because i know a few other groups maybe somebody has passed away and they they can't be back there but yeah to, to keep the call it, it, it's it's very impressive especially after that that span of time when the record first came out i remember watching the new edition stuff they were coming back from tour, but going back to the, to the to their homes and stuff. Did they did RCA move you guys into you know Manhattan into penthouses, or were you still back in? Um, RCA didn't move us into shit. <laughs> Everything comes with a price, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, they didn't pay shit. I paid. <laughs> Okay, so before I got my my I, the condo in, in Jersey, I stayed at the Renaissance Hotel in Times Square. Wow. That's when I learned that um, everything comes with a price. They wasn't putting me up in shit. That was a bill that we had to pay. Wow. And I stayed there for like three months. And no one told you that this, no one tells you? No, they don't tell you shit. They don't tell you nothing. They don't tell you nothing. You just find the only person that tell you anything is your accountant. Because one thing you're going to tell you, your ass is broke. (laughs) 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 
That's the only one that's doing some talking is the accountant, you know? Wow. But nobody don't tell you nothing. Wow. It, 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 it's, it's hard for us, as I said, as, as fans, to, just to see how, you know, young, talented people just get no, with no, no, you know, you think someone like, you know, um, Brandy, um, whose mum or Usher, you know, they have parents who, or even Beyonce and Destiny Child, when you have parents, they know what's going on. They, they sort of look after them, but that's very rare to have not too many people like that. But see, this is the thing. And, and I'm not, um, I'm not trying to diminish anybody's character at all. But sometimes when you're coming up in a profession like this, the people that brought you in, they don't know no more than what you know. Mm. So that's part of the problem as well. You got a whole lot of inexperienced people who are just ignorant to how the industry works and how paperwork works. You know what I mean? Mm. Like we weren't, we didn't know back then that we got to get a lawyer to watch this lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> and this account to look over this accountant's book, you know, like we didn't know, we didn't have that lesson back then. Wow. So thing is literally trial and error. And when I look at these artists now and see how much money they get, I'm like, shit. <laughs> we came out too early. <laughs> you know, like, yo, they getting paid. But I love it though. Like whenever I get an opportunity to tell somebody these stories and these lessons that I had, I mean, I, I have put a lot of the stuff in my book as well, but um, I love it. I love to see the new artists today that's just doing a thing, man. They doing a thing. And if, if you've been following me, you know, I love me some her. Like I yeah. love her. That's my little baby. And I just see her just, She's just blossoming. Mm. Just be position. Yeah. She ain't naked. She ain't selling ass. Yeah, yeah. Just getting paid to be a musician. Yeah. And that is heard of nowadays. Yeah. Okay. Do you remember when when you, you sat down with Donnie and, and you just you were promoting downtown and he he said, Oh, you guys are church girls and what are you singing about? And, and and it almost feels as if you didn't realize the song that you've been recording. No, I knew from day one what that song was about. <laughs> <laughs> that story came from, but I knew what that song was about. <laughs> trying to figure out a tasteful way to say it. <laughs> I, I ain't got nothing to do with me. I know, I knew what that song was about. From day one, <laughs> <laughs> but 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 then did you guys have a choice in in, in you know when, when you here's a song to sing it or did could you say anything or were you just like well I'm just what was it like for being young recording artists and the head of the labels are bringing these producers with these tracks? Well, I think we had a um, a hand in picking the songs because we never really do songs we don't like okay. most of the time. And then sometimes artists really don't know what they're talking about because um, there were songs we didn't like and those songs went like bananas, you know? They went bananas and right here being one of them. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. I, the remix for um, um, Human Nature remix, um, I remember um, interviewing Mucho, uh, Mucho Scott, and he was at Future and he says, yeah, you guys all came down, um, but you guys weren't really feeling it and stuff. Um, it, it, what, I mean, one of the you know, biggest singles in the 90s, but what, what, did you like the original and didn't want to mess it up? I love the original. That I don't know. It was, you know, being from New York City is something. Ah. Everything was about this. You know, yeah. if you was to bop it and do that, then yo, that is gonna work like it's dope. Yeah. But song, even today, it's so boring to me. <laughs> I mean, it's definitely a song that you could enjoy on the radio, but it's not one of my favorite songs to perform. It's so boring. 
even today is just boring to me. <laughs> so I can understand because it's slow. I think most of will, because of the Michael Jackson sort of underplay in it, I think that's what really, really got us like, wow, you got Michael on it. Um, and I think, but, and, and yeah, it, as I said, it, it, it isn't, I'm so into you. My favorite from you guys was I'm so into you. I, 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 I get it musically. Teddy Riley has always been my, my biggest ever in anything he does. And so when mm -hmm. I, got the remix that he did with um, Rex and Effect and the whole check one, check two. I mean, I love, love that single and stuff. Um, yeah, so he's dope. Yeah. And, and so, I mean, and I, I know All Star also did, 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 did some tracks with, with you guys as well, but I, I did love those types, those, the remixes, um, because it, it showcased, it really took the song you know, not taking anything away from the original, but it, it really took the song across to people who didn't really hear the, the first oh, one. Yes, yeah. for sure. I mean, that song took off. And I'll, you know, at the time, his name is Kenny Ortiz. He really, he shut us up on that one. Like he, if there was ever a time we were proven to be wrong and we need to shut the hell up sometime, <laughs> moment, because... You know, as artists, we, we always like to do things that we like to do and we want to do, but we never like, we, we don't think about the business side of it and wow, you know, we can build this audience and we can gravitate towards this audience like and, and make it not just like a, our record, but an everybody record. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and that's what you said, should definitely have in mind when you go in the studio and record songs, you want a record that everybody can sing. Can enjoy, yeah. And those records are the records that win. Yeah, yeah. Simplicity yeah. always best. It it always works. Like yeah. you got some best singers who can't sell records because no one can sing like that. Mm, yeah, I mean that's probably how I got into you guys. Is that I'm I'm so into you. Just like you know, anything Teddy did, I bought, and 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 you know that that that's how I I, I got in it. I I do wonder then. Um, when was it like going back to the Apollo for the first time? Because here's your here's your eight year old person who has totally prophesied to your mom, "I'm going to come as a guest." Can you remember the very first show you did as part of SWV? Mm. I believe it was a actually it was Jack the Rapper. I want to say Jack the Rapper was the first. That was a big music convention in Atlanta. Oh yeah, yeah, back yeah, and um. That was the one of the first real performances that we've done, you know, and it was just I I never forget Jack the Rapper because all the record labels had their artists there, so it was like one big party. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> where each artist, each record label, like uh, rented out a different room in the hotel, mm. and the artists would show their artists would showcase like um, Uptown MCA would have their their um or their room i see we have their room where it'd be swv shante savage and oh, shante. it was a, a girl group on our label as well called black girl oh yeah i'm a 90s girl yeah i remember that yeah girl, like, yeah and they were super dope too i ain't gonna front but they were, <laughs> oh they were dope they yeah. were really and um but we were just two different groups like you know you can't you couldn't take us we was going to take the Bronx and Brooklyn wherever we went. <laughs> they like, I just feel like it's so important to rep where you from. Like people get on me because of the way I talk. I'm not corporate. I'm not none of that stuff, but I can, I, I can transition from talking to my friends to talking to somebody who is unfamiliar with where I'm from. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I love that. I love everything the hood have to offer, honey, because that was my stomping ground. Yeah. That's how I learned a lot of my lessons. What about when you first went back to Apollo as a guest? Can you remember that? When I first went back to the Apollo as a guest, absolutely. Um, I think we had on, oh, God. I think we had doobies in our hair. I had a beige jumpsuit, some beige overalls, 
Oh, that outfit was so ugly. <laughs> well, yeah, it was exciting because I was like, oh, my God. And then, you know, the crowd, just knowing that the crowd wasn't going to boo us. We <laughs> were so it's this thing when you go on the, the Apollo stage and you like a guest and they're excited about you. They jump up immediately. They jump up right away, you know. So I love just the energy. It was amazing. It was good. It was really good. Did you did you get did your mom come to see at the Apollo? My mom was at the Apollo for that particular show. Absolutely. Yes, she was. Did she remember yeah. what you said when you were a kid? Did she did... Oh, yeah. she remembered? She remembered. Wow. Yep, she remembered. And my mom lived long enough to see that come to pass and she died. Oh, when did she, how long ago did she die? My mom died two years, three years after we, um, after SWV was born. Wow, wow, sorry. Three years after that Apollo Theater performance, our first Apollo Theater performance, my mom passed away. Wow. Mm-hmm. How did you manage at that young age? It was hard. I had to go to the funeral and go back to work. You know? Wow. Did, did, did you get any emotional support and therapeutic support from the labels and management? And Oh, yeah. Okay. Now, that is support. <laughs> so it's sad somebody got to die for them to, to feel some type of compassion for you. But, you know, yeah, absolutely. And I'll never forget, I have this beautiful story about Heavy D, right? Heavy D was the first celebrity that sent me flowers when my mom passed away. Wow. So I will always remember Heavy D. When I tell you he sent the most beautiful flowers for my mom, they had they couldn't even fit all the flowers in a funeral home. It was just wow. beautiful. Wow. Did a lot of people reach out to support you within the, in the well uh, yeah, yeah, but not not a lot, you know, because we didn't have the access we had back then. Like everybody didn't have your phone number. But I didn't have a phone number. We had beepers. Oh yeah, beepers had pages. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah have cell phones we have beepers and you know the sidekicks was popular at one point and mm -hmm. um, a lot of people didn't really have my phone number but of course through my co-workers they kind of sent their condolences yeah. to me and I received it you know wow that's no as I said but and 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 but you still had your family support to look after your kids while okay. you're still Absolutely, for sure. Yeah, yeah. You know, I know when you when you guys did um, went to New Beginnings and you the production changed. You got different producers and stuff. Um, was there any concern about losing your your fans because who got used to the sound you had in about time? And when you you moved, yet um, did you did you have anything with Puffy? Was that um, with Puffy and someone, someone, someone. yes, yeah. So it, it was a sort of different, but the, it, yeah, it was sort of di different. I mean, I still had all, I bought all your albums, but I'm just wondering, did you want worry about uh, the fans might think, oh, this is not like Week and 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 and, uh, and our first album? No, no, because um, when you when you're a creative you want to do just that you want to be creative and it's almost impossible to recreate something like weak you know what i mean like we already gave you that now it's time to move on to something else but of course i don't think we ever stray too far away from what the fans enjoy now i do say that that third record that released some tension record was horrible <laughs> <laughs> with that record that record was so bad and I think you know that was actually after you know they made some label changes and wow. the guy 
uh, the A&R who found SWV and all of those amazing records, for some reason, they let him go and bought somebody else in who totally destroyed that album. Mm -hmm. And he knows how I feel about that today. So I ain't saying nothing. <laughs> <laughs> But I mean, you shit, don't take my word for it. Look at it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it sells. Yeah. I felt like that was a waste of our budget. I felt like, you know, it was all of these damn rappers featuring SWB. I felt like we was on somebody else's album. Yeah. And it was a waste of our budget. You know, it was just that, oh, just the thought. Rain saved that record. Yeah. Rain saved that record because that was the only reason I listened to that record. I ain't played nothing <laughs> except for, I think it was a song in there called On and On. Andrea Martin wrote that song. Yeah, um, God rest her. Soul. yeah and um, everything she did I thought was dope, but yeah. the album just had all of these rappers on there and I'm like, the Ugh. I just thought it was stupid. It was very dumb business wise. Like, why would you do that? You know, and and you know, and you know, you know. I know we all love Redman and 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 the rest, but I know that it it's it show it's it was the prelude of what happened to R&B, where they started to put more hip hop, and hip hop almost became okay, because you guys almost pretty much ushered in the fact that. We get a hip hop artist singing R and B, and we get the R and B artist featuring because that then became the norm, which is, it's still unfortunately the dominant part then, and and I think that's more and more we lost the essence of, of you guys with, with with a lot of those tracks that were, that were being pushed out and mm -hmm. um, and yeah that, that 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 was a but but you couldn't fight it you you know it's hard you know i think we would wonder if you guys could could fight it or do anything you just had to accept what what the label what they how they spend the money i mean pretty pretty much i mean you can give them a hard time but for what when they have all the control okay you want to give me a hard time we're going to push this record back yeah so if we don't have a record we don't we can't tour we can't make money yeah you know, so it ain't but so much you can do with the person that got the purse. When you, when you when the person got the bag, what you gonna say? Yeah. It's been a journey, you know. So, but I I've always been verbal about the fact that I thought that that album was whack. But then it, it was that the last album you did with RCA then because it didn't do as well as the first two. I want to say that was, yeah. and it should because that was terrible. Yeah. And a guy who put that record together should have been fired. I, I don't think it was long after that he got fired, but he should have gotten fired. <laughs> yeah. But then what, because I know a year after the album comes out, that's when you guys took your hi hiatus and mm -hmm. stuff. Um, what is that like? Because, as you said, if you're not a featured songwriter producer on your albums so you're, you're collecting all the publishing and stuff and you're relying on on tour when uh, the label who has been your home for almost 10 years says okay you know not, not even up to 10 years you know you know, seven eight years says you know we're, we're dropping you guys what what do you do then as a, as as lily <laughs> Well, Lily, I, I pretty much um, went into my sunken place because it was like a marriage to me. And then that's when I realized that somebody had so much control. They controlled my mind. They controlled whether I moved forward in my career or not. Like that was just the turning point for me. And I was young. Like I was doing this longer than I wasn't. You know, so I went to that sunken place and that's when the, all the suicidal thoughts started happening and I was just going to just take it all out. I was going to eat and D it because I couldn't face a lot of the stuff that I was dealing with. I didn't want to. I didn't want people to see me any different than what they, than how they knew me and how they met me. And now that was taken away from me. Wow. You know what I mean? But, um... It took for that to happen for me to 
to turn into and blossom into the woman that I am today. That was really a turning point for me mentally, emotionally, spiritually, and physically, because something like that could just suck the life out of you. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I lost weight. Like I just, I didn't, I had no identity. I didn't know who I was. I, I didn't even know my name. My first name didn't mean shit to me. The name that my mother gave me didn't mean shit to me because I got so stuck on fans calling me Lily, Lily, Lily. So Leanne. Oh, Leanne. I'm sorry. <laughs> you forgot? No, oh, but yeah, because, yeah, that's, I forget it's a stage name. We just <laughs> You're so, so, even to me, like, it was one of the things like, oh my God. And I had to realize, yo, I am somebody. Like, this doesn't define me. This is just a chapter in my life and in, in my journey. And you don't think about that until you're in that sunken place. Yeah. I mean, if I, you, you know, I got a job. I got everything. Listen, y'all ain't getting all of this stuff. Y'all better get the book. I, I got to get this book. <laughs> this book. Has everything, uh, has everything you want to know in it. Is it I regret the day I lost my virginity? I regret the day I lost my virginity. You are not your past. And all of these stories that I'm telling you is all in here in depth. Like I, this was my therapy. This was, this was the, the thing that I did that belongs to me. I own a hundred percent of my book and every word that I say in here. So I was very proud of this. And um, it, it took me out of bondage because I, I was broken. I was broke. I didn't, I didn't know who I was. I didn't know where I was going. I didn't know anything. Within our community, and as uh, you know, even though my family is African uh, Nigerian, but but as Black, mental health talking, um, and and shown vulnerability, is something that it almost seems like a taboo. And the fact that you're sharing this is really important because, even because as a therapist, I'm one of the only Black male therapists in in my account. Well, in, in working with young ch with children. Very few of our patients are black because as families, they don't accept. So the fact that you're sharing this is, is really powerful. But how did you get, who helped, who reached out to pull you out of that? That's, um, because it's, you know, most of us, you know, the industry you worked in, it, they're cutthroat. Friends might have been, you might have tried to hide from people. Mm -hmm. And you um, and. Your, your, your rock and your, as of, of your mom had, had passed. Um, did, who reached out? Did you have, who, who could you turn to? Well, I've always had my family to turn to, but a lot of things that was going on with me, my family didn't know about. Wow. They had no idea, you know? So I had to deal with this stuff alone. And I, I made up, my mind that this was going to be the day that I checked myself out of here. I was committing and comfortable with the fact that I was going to take my life. And um, I remember making one, two calls. I said I was going to call my sisters to to tell them to just, you know, I love them, take care of my kids. And um my sister didn't answer the phone the first time, but my other sister answered the phone as soon as I called. And it was like a divine intervention. She said, just come home. Just come home. And just crying. We're both boo-hooing on the phone. Just crying. And she's like, just come home, sis. Come home. And it just kind of gave me like a calm to the point where I, when I say I've never cried myself to death, like I, 
if if me hurting myself wasn't going to take me out i felt like all of these all this crying was going to take me out because i cried so much my whole body was dry like i was so dehydrated my mouth was like foaming and it was just crazy but i there was a light at the end of that phone call it was a light at the end of that phone call and i chose life i chose to live and at the time i was staying in a hotel i ran out of money i couldn't afford to get another day at, at the hotel the marriott hotel that's why i love the marriott to this day because me and the marriott have a connection <laughs> you know <laughs> we have like Yeah, you know, you know we went through Marriott. <laughs> <laughs> But um yeah, so I went back in that room and I just I literally beat myself up. Like I I, I cursed myself out. How dare you 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 going to do something so selfish you you fucking coward like you you just making you know you making the devil happy by doing all of these things and you and your thoughts are crazy and you weren't raised this way but you just want to take yourself out your weak you a loser like i was saying all kind of shit to myself in a mirror like i was literally looking at myself like you a coward just crying and then the cry ended up being it ended up turning into laughter <laughs> it became funny i'm like what the hell was i thinking and that's how i know that i don't know the presence of god to me is, is so real because my dark moment i was just dark 30 minutes ago i wanted to check out and now i'm laughing i'm i'm smiling i love who i see now and i chose to live when i walked out of that hotel room it was like i never thought about anything that i was thinking an hour ago mm. because when i said out my mouth that i'm cho i'm choosing to live i got a lot of shit to do on this planet before you know god take me home like i ain't got to take myself out god is going to help me out with that but at his time that's what it was for me and my life changed instantly i got a job i went home like my sister said i i spent the night at her house i was staying with her and the crazy thing was i wasn't making the money that i was making when i was with my group but i was making 10 11 dollars an hour but i was so peaceful And that's why I always tell people who complain about their jobs, you do what you have to do until you can do what you want to do. Stop fucking complaining because your shit can be different. Your story can be that different. I went through making money to making 10, 11 dollars an hour. I have no car. I did a voluntary repo. I took everything back that I felt like didn't belong to me. honestly like i'm like fuck this car fuck this fuck that and you know i didn't care i'm like if god had blessed me the first time he would bless me with it again and he's done that over and over again but you have to speak life into your own situation and that's what i did that's what my mother did for me and that's what i did for myself and that's when i I realized that I was dope. I was amazing. I it, it take an amazing person to be ridiculed in front of a lot of people. See you working at an office job and they just call your extension just to hear your voice because they the superstar has has a job now. You know? She ain't shit no more. She's just like us, which I've always been. But it didn't matter what they were saying because I was at peace. I knew how much money I was going to make. I knew what I was bringing home. I knew if I bust this clock down and I put in all this overtime what I was going to make. So I started slowly. 
I said, okay, I ain't got no car, but the first thing I'm going to get is a car. So I bust up. I was doing 18 hours, 14 hours, like at this job. And every two weeks I got paid, I was able to do something different. The first two weeks I was able to get me a car. It was a piece of shit, but it was a car and it was a blessing. And I got it. So I knew once I got that car, the car was going to get me to my money. It's going to get me more money because I can always drive the car and push come to shove. You know, you lose your place. You can always sleep in your car. And that's why I tell people today, like, cars are special. I look at cars different. That's why I always buy a truck. I never buy a truck because shit, if shit go bad, I'll sleep in this damn truck. <laughs> wow. <laughs> you know? But, you know, I can laugh about it now and um, because I'm free. I'm free from it. And that's why I don't mind talking about it because I need to free somebody else. Mm -hmm. And let them know that they are not their past. Like, they are strong. And don't always look for people, for validation in people, because you may never get it. You may mm -hmm. never get it, you know? So, so, so I've, you know, I've, I've had people call and say they're just about to walk to a train station and jump in front of a train. And I've had to, you know, and, and, and I realize back in those early days when I used to do crisis, you can't tell them, oh, what about your family? Because when you've made up your mind, family, amazing. kids means nothing. You're almost thinking they acted, they're going to be better off without me. Yeah, yeah. And, and so it's, you have to think something else, not, you can't just, you know, you have to, because the whole thing is, I failed everybody, and, and by going, they're going to be better off. And you can reason with with someone like that, but the fact that you didn't have any ex, well, I won't say external intervention. You 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 had a divine intervention to to switch. That's not an easy switch. That that mm -hmm. going from wanting to end your life to saying no, I need to shape up, and you know that's that's a movie. You know, someone would say, oh, that's a movie, like a guardian agent stuff. It's definitely a movie. And hopefully, lifetime, I want to tell this story. But um, my whole mission, man, I, just kind of thinking about everything I went through in my life and how things turned out and how I was able to just keep myself afloat and just, just stay alive. Because I just think about how different things could have been. And that's why everything that I do today is intentional. I'm not feeling bad for myself. I'm not feeling bad for people because I'm like, yo, if I did it, it, it ain't that hard for you. You mm. know what I mean? I just think we have to make up our mind to do it. You know? And no, it's not going to always be easy. It wasn't easy for me. But I made up my mind to do it. I put one foot in front of the other and I did it. Where, where did that come from? That because that's you're talking about the degree of humility that even us who have never been in the spotlight will struggle with. Um, for 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 somebody who dominated the charts, who was you know you you you, you weren't a one hit wonder. You you, you came out with you, you know you had one of the biggest singles of the decade. Very recognizable, and you're getting a, a job, and you and and you are appreciating, you know, ten, eleven bucks an hour, and, and and thinking small steps to big steps. Where did that come from? Because it's very few people who even who aren't famous would do that. But how? Where, where did that sense of humility come from? I think um, I finally start loving myself. Because I had to realize that I started, I wanted, I looked for validation in men. I looked for if he didn't think I was pretty or if I wasn't chosen, it would depress me. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And, um, you know, you, you men, you have a choice. And this is all when I was a teenager. But um, I had to learn how to love myself. And I realized I didn't love myself for a long time because I didn't know what that felt like, you know? 
I didn't know what loving myself meant until I was, until I had to stand alone, literally. I was alone. Nobody knew what was going on with me. They just knew that the group wasn't together, but they didn't know what was going on with me. I was alone. I would talk to myself. I would give myself every reason I should be here. Then in my darker moments, I gave myself every reason that I should just die. Oh, they'll be, they'll be okay without me. They don't give a fuck anyway. You know, like, oh, life will just go on. No one wanna miss me. Eh. But all of that changed. Like you can either look at the glass half empty or look at it half full. And then I had to tell myself that I was so dope. Hmm. I'm telling you, like, I literally had to tell myself, I, I was thinking of all of these different things that was great about me. And I'm like, damn, you know, it's more great stuff in me than not. Why am I angry? Why am I so mad? And that's why I'm big on energy today. Because you can be happy and then the, the spirits are coming around you and you just get angry. You start doing shit that you wasn't thinking about doing before. And you're like, ugh, you know? But it's so important that we love ourselves. It's so important that we tell ourselves that we're dope. We tell ourselves that we're beautiful. We tell ourselves that there was there's somebody in this world that's gonna love me the way I love myself. And, and that's, and, and I've never been married, but I'm waiting for that guy that will love Leanne like Leanne loves herself. And until that happens, I will not be married. I will be single. <laughs> yeah. Cause this is a lot of love I give myself, honey. Like it's, 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 it's overwhelming sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so I, you know, I have a seven year old grandbaby who's going to be eight and I want her to not have to depend on anybody's love. I want her to be able to do like this and know that this is enough. This is enough. Cause you may not get it. Yeah. And if you don't get it, what you gonna do? You gonna be a coward like your grandmother would have been and take yourself out and get mad because no one wants to love you. So what? Nobody don't have to love you. But you have to love yourself. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I, what, yeah. One of my fourteen-year-old patients, I told her job over the next three weeks is to put a positive affirmation each day, because uh, unless you, as you said, learn to love yourself, you can't depend on somebody else's love because they will always let you down. Ooh, every time, every single time. And that's why we see a lot of unhappy things happen in the world today. I just read something today, a guy in Germany took his whole family out. You know, how this man killed his uh, ex-girl, his ex-wife or something. And I think it was his wife, his ex-wife and left the kids in a car. Like everybody's unhappy. Yeah. You know what I mean? And what are you gonna do when you get unhappy? Because we can always, you know, create an environment where we're, ha where we're happy and things are going well. Well, that's not life. Things yeah. are not always gonna go well. So what are you gonna do when, it, when, when you no longer have no, nothing to laugh about or smile about? Or you don't have a, a pretty song to sing? What are you gonna do? You gonna yeah. check out? You gonna make everybody else miserable? No. Sit down and take a minute. Maybe you're moving around too much. Just sit still and figure out, okay, how did I get here? You have your own answers to your own questions. We just don't ask the questions. Yeah. Sometimes we are afraid of ourselves. Yeah. I, yeah, I can imagine your mom being very proud of how, you know, you, you, you're able to figure it out for yourself. And, and because as I said, um, I've worked in mental health for a long time. It's not as easy, but 
taking the steps that you've shown. It, it's something that I wish everyone, especially mm -hmm. those who are watching who are in a black community, just to understand that, yeah, you know, it, it's, you know, reaching out for help, admitting that, you know, things are a struggle and taking stock. Mm -hmm. um, because, yeah, it's yeah. hard, to, you know, yeah. Very hard, but you, but you have to just speak, speak it into your own life. Yeah, you do. Wait on people too much. Like we depend on people for too much. We give people way too much credit. Yeah. Way too much credit. Yo, let me tell you, if I'm dating somebody, he decide he don't want me no more. <laughs> I'm not gonna be banging on your door. I'm not gonna make you want me. I ain't got that kind of problem. Like, I, I know, you know, you were option two, and I chose to give you the time. But then that's another thing. It's like we be in these relationships and we give people more time than they deserve with us. Friendships, more time than they deserve with us. We feeling bad, but we feel this so so connected to them because of familiarity and just being comfortable. They know all my business. So <laughs> tell it. I don't give a damn. Tell it. Tell it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness. <laughs> yeah. Remember you have like so many different reasons why we hold on to shit, you know. And it don't mean us nothing. 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 Wow. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, and uh, you know, it's really been great. I mean, hearing your inspiration as a side of things. Um, but also seeing, I mean, that's, that's amazing the, 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 the journey you took from being at the Marriott and deciding, you know, to turn things around and being excited about making $11 an hour and almost planning ahead. And, and as I said, it's, for the, most of us, it's it's even without the fame, it's hard. Um, but I, I, that's the reason why we did this was to show people that look, we saw you rocking the soul trains and around the world, and then mm -hmm. it did it. You know, it lost everything, but you still have come out on the other side, and 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 almost for other people to think, you know, my talk, my stuff mm -hmm. is tough, but listening mm -hmm. to what Lily has gone through. You know, it's it you know it it can't be as tough as that, and so I need to just buckle myself up and and and, and move forward. Yes, and this and this now I think sometimes we complicate our situation more than than it, than it really is because we don't want to accept the how did I get here part when we're the reason why we got here. That shit don't no mm -mm, I ain't gonna put it on me. Mm. But most of the time, we're the reason why we got here. Or even if it's somebody else that got you to this point, admit it. Own it. Own it. Like, yo, I wasn't as attentive as I should have been. You know, or I didn't do this. Like, I should have went left and I went right. Or should have gone right, I went left. You know, but... But in your case, though, the you didn't know about the industry so and so there's you couldn't have people always say well I could have gone on a lawyer but in reality could you have done anything you know you didn't put the third album together you, you know what could you have done to stop being dropped I don't think is anything I could have done yeah nothing at all like like I said everything that I learned in this business was trial and error Mm. I had to be homeless to know that I don't ever want to experience this again. Mm. You know, as a young girl, we had to get put out every other month to know that I need something that's a little, that's going to stabilize me to the point where I don't want to get evicted again. Mm. You know, and, and that's just how, how it happened for me. You know, I wish it was different. You know, I, I wish I was a trust fund baby sometimes, but that that ain't how to, how it was laid out for me. Yeah. I went through some real shit, you know, and I had to learn some real lessons, you know, through myself and, and through other people. 
But then how did you get to trust to come back to, because you, you, you then have created um, a safety net, which is a mindset of, um, by doing this nine to five, even with the overtime, I'm able to build a nest and I, and I can trust that this is, this is tangible. But well, then... guess what? It was a lot easier coming back the oh. second time because now I knew that I could survive without this. Okay. Once you survive, when people tell you, oh, you ain't going, you ain't going to do shit, you ain't going to do nothing. I actually was living a very modest, peaceful life without it. So I'm like, you know, okay. So if we do this again, I get to make a little bit more money and I'm on point now. So I know if something else happens, I can go this way again. Mm. I have, at least I got a pot now. Mm. And I know what to do with the pot. Yeah. See, before I know what to do with the pot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Barely, barely there. <laughs> so, so even money and it just started looking different, you know. And even today, like I'm a saver. Okay. I'm scared to, to spend money, you know. Like I, I can if I want to, but I don't. I don't want to. That's not the desire for me yeah. anymore. Yeah. Like, I'm, something, I'm 30 years in a game and not anything to show for it. Like, to, I, I was just telling, you know, a few people the other day, we was on this um, this three-way call, and I was like, you know, it's so sad that a lot of these artists have to work because they have to and not because they want to. We've yeah. been doing it 30 years, ain't got shit to show for it. Yeah. We should all have our homes paid for. Like, it, it should, why? Why? Why are we still doing this? Because we want we have to and not because we want to yeah you know and, and i think that's the, um the relationship with money is quite different so a lot of british musicians come from money so they're not they don't chase money and actually the, the record labels give respect them differently give them better deals and you know the, the recent one album they're already multi-millionaires because it's but they're not doing it for the money, but the money's there. And I, and I think it's uh, stuff that is, as um, even in Africa, Nigeria and stuff, you know, we're still under a sort of a curse of poverty where it doesn't matter how much you make, you still, you still have hardly anything to show for it. But I think generationally, the next generation are, are, are faring better, have a different relationship with money. Um, so like your grandkids now are going to see money differently. They're not going to fear it. They're not going to be, they're gonna they're gonna know it's pl put it in its place, and then build for the next generation. I think that's the thing that we definitely have to do because I know my kids are not gonna have look at money the same way I say my parents looked at, at at money, and I think that's the one thing that you've set us a, a legacy uh, for, mm -hmm. uh, which is important. It, mm -hmm. Did you guys did you do the documentary when you came back? Because I know the one that uh, I've seen on on, on YouTube. Um, that you, that you guys did the the not the documentary but it's like the reality show. Um, um, was, was that sort of the reunion coming back? Oh no, we've been out when we did that. We we got back together in two thousand and five. Oh okay. Yeah, that was just a part of everything that we just went through. You know, that was just a jo another job opportunity. Yeah, we were already together. So coming back now, because as we're wrapping up, because I know you guys, I mean, you're headline, headlining festivals. I mean, I, I saw the stuff you guys did in, uh, in, in, New, in New York. You'd be going to Atlanta. Stadiums are full. So everyone's singing along and stuff. And, and it's like, it's almost, you know, and, and people rightly celebrate you guys as one of our premier R&B groups um, that have been, did, does... Does the touring become like, yep, we're going to just enjoy our touring? Is there any, not pressure, but is there any desire to record new music? Or do you think, well, there's no real point. We just enjoy doing the touring and, 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 and using our catalogue. Well, sometimes you, you, you feel like, um, what's the use of recording music when 
we're doing what we need to do. They love those older records. They love those records. And sometimes I just think that's what they want. That's what they want to hear. You know, because we've done other records before, but I mean, it was just kind of lukewarm because we was with a label that was smaller than the group that they signed. You know what I mean? We were actually bigger than our label. So they didn't know what to do with us, you know? But um, yeah, yeah, sometimes I don't think it's a desire anymore. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Because you've been doing this for so long and you've been doing it the same way for so long. And the only thing that will make a difference is the money have to change. That's it. That's it. Because now it's time for a lot of 90s artists to get fruits of their labor. Mm. You know? And I'm ready for my fruit. I sacrificed a lot for this shit. I'm ready to see some fruit. Some real fruit. <laughs> yeah. But did you think the, since the lockdown with Pastor Mike, you guys were on it twice and versus with Escape. Do you, do you, has that opened wide more doors for you guys? Absolutely, trust me. Like, <laughs> now, it ain't no, it ain't no, nothing has slowed down, you know. <laughs> Not all, like, even before we did the verses, <laughs> like, we booked the whole 2020. Wow. And I'm, I kid you not, like, don't get me wrong, like, it, them checks is coming in. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? But, you know, you just feel like you just want to get what, what you're worth. Yeah. You know, you, you've been doing it forever. It's like, yo, I don't want yours. Give me what belongs to me. Yeah. It's time for, you know, we, we pay some dues. Like, we've done a lot. You know, so it's time for us to enjoy the fruits of our labor as well as many other amazing artists who sacrificed to do this. And um, they need to, to, we need to die peacefully, peacefully, yeah. rich, comfortable. Yeah. And, you know, we need, it, it's so crazy because I look at these other artists and you get like a Katy Perry who's worth $300 million. <laughs> yeah. Yo, that shit bothers me. I'm like, well, how? Yeah. So. Yeah. You yeah. Know. No, I mean, we have the Dua Lupa, Ed Sheeran, Adele, you know, they come out with one or two albums and then they're all the multi-millionaires and, and you oh, know. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And this, yeah. yeah. Same record labels and you're wondering, well, do they have uh, different deals in place than, uh, than our... Just, I just think they handle African American artists a little different than they handle the other artists. Yeah. And we don't fight for shit. We need to start fighting for stuff. Yeah. You know. Did, would you ever do what Ashanti was doing and and um, Taylor 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 Swift, which is re-record? Absolutely. That's that's the smart thing to do. You should own your masters. I think that's a, an amazing move because everybody's making money off of you. So you own your masters, you re-record your songs and people will buy the re-recorded versions and hoping you get it as close to the original as possible. And then, you know, that's money in your pocket. That's money in the bank. Would you guys ever consider doing that? Oh, we thought you, I can't tell you everything. <laughs> You just digging, ain't you? <laughs> no, 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 no. But it's but, it's something. Yeah. Absolutely, is is the smart thing to do. Okay. Yeah. It's the smart thing to do. Yeah. No, and and, and as I said, I've, I've I've been when I talk to artists, I'd say, look, don't go. Why go and do re, your cover version of Stevie Wonder when you can do cover versions of your own stuff? That. Yeah. You, that understand that like i i'm i'm at the point now i ain't in that business to make nobody else rich i am looking out for my own fucking pockets like i'm serious because nobody don't they don't support you they don't they don't 
do, you know, they don't acknowledge you. Sometimes the industry is so cruel, yeah. you know? I want everybody to make their money. I want everybody to be able to have, you know, generational wealth or whatever. Yeah. But I'm at the point now in my life, I have to think about me. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like I'm in a second, third quarter of life. Shit, it's going to be over me. God only promised us 70 years. I got damn near. <laughs> <laughs> you got another 50, don't worry. <laughs> at least. <laughs> I, but. You know, I mean, hey, it's time for us to just sit on the beach and and drink a pineapple cranberry juice mix with yeah. cherries. You are, well, you know what? When when Michael was told he had fifty shows in London, and he, you know, I, I bought a ticket, and sadly he passed before he could come. But the, we we heard that he actually was not happy that they were giving him that many shows because we're so used to seeing him on stage, not realizing how much of a strain it is. And I think a lot of us didn't understand why artists were performing in the later years without realizing that she, the money, that's the livelihood and, and, and stuff. Um, listen, listen, listen. It's a check. It is all about the check. These people do not like you. Half of them don't love you. They don't know. Half of the people at my label right now don't know we dead or alive. It is about the money. You are not a person. You have a product that they can milk and make money from. See, people don't know. We're the last ones that get paid. We pay everybody else. We're the last. We get the, the crumbs. I mean, the crumbs don't look like y'all crumbs, but they nice crumbs, but <laughs> never ends the way it starts off. Wow. <laughs> Wow. You know, oh. Wow. I think as we as we as we wrap up, because I know we've been doing it for a while, but um what can we expect in 2022? Because I know that you've got the the jazz festival. Is that in uh, is that the one in New Orleans or oh that's the one in Miami. Oh uh, Miami. Um See you, yeah. <laughs> so you've got a jazz festival in Miami with with her and this Miss Mary. Uh, M, 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 Miss Mary J, which which is such an amazing building. I mean, could, how did you? What did... So excited about that! I, you know, I'm a woman that loves a good story, and when I see Mary and how she's grown, like I think about twenty something years ago. You know, people would say little things about her and and question her gift, and I never ever question her gift. Mary is so amazing to me. And she showed everybody that she can stand. And she has. So she's an inspiration to me. And with her as well, like I'm learning a lot from a lot of these younger artists. Mm. You know? And that's the truth. So I'm excited about everything that's going on. That's a big show. I mean, what do you, do you guys have any other things planned for 2022 that you want to share? I mean, concerts or tours? Well, we have, um, just know that it's our 30th anniversary. Whoa. So all I can say is that you stay tuned. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, are we going to see you in the UK? Because, I mean, I'm, I'm here in the UK, the US... I I love the UK. I love me some London. I love England. Actually, I got a friend that live over there too, but I love it over there. I wish they would have us back. Yeah, I mean, I put, to, I mean we, we, we're struggling with COVID now, but I know in the summer, you know, it's 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 the I I I, I don't dabble with the promotion side, but I I would I'm sure you guys are always headline. Um, if, oh yeah, most of the time, yeah. Wow, no, it it would yeah. That's the one thing I miss about being in the states that I don't get to see you guys. But um, it, so we may see you do a lot of you know celebrate your thirtieth anniversary on the road. You are you any follow up from with as an author and author? Um, are you going to do any other writing? Absolutely, writing has become really special to me. Like I said, this is my first 
offering right here. Um, I regret the day I lost my virginity. You are not your past. And this was like the first book that I ever wrote. So I'm working on um, an erotica book right now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> like it's, it sounds crazy, but it's really like, you know, because women don't really talk about sexual things without feeling uncomfortable. And the name of the, the audio book is The Many Faces of Sister Hot Pussy. So it, it's a, a, a collage of a whole lot of different stories and situations that women face that are sexual or not. Like it could be a thought, it could be something that they acted on, but these are professional women who just tap into their sexuality. And um, I don't know why we are so afraid to talk about sex. You know what I'm saying? We so afraid and we think people are gonna look at us some type of way, but that's not what it is. But so I have an audio erotica book coming like ASAP and it's called The Many Faces of Sister Hot Pussy. And then I'm gonna start writing my book based on my life during the quarantine. Wow. Yeah, so I love this writing. I love owning my shit. I <laughs> I just love it. I yeah. enjoy it. And also, um, I want to do a transitional home in honor of my mom. And I put that out there before. And it's called Margaret's Linen Room. That was my mom's name. And um, for a single mother, single mothers and um, single parents. And I just want to do something for women. That's yeah. going to, you know, because you have a lot of women who are married to men and when they break up with the man, they're in the street. They're hungry. So I want to provide a transitional home for them so that they can have some type of comfort and, and learn the skills that they need to learn to survive. Wow. Yeah. Wow. I mean, I, I know that um, uh, um, your website has has a book and also has some of your merchandise as well. Mm -hmm. So when we're putting this out, we will definitely put the link to that so people can click yes, on. Yes, I'm rebranding. It's called Cutie in a Hoodie. And that was inspired because I'm a girl that loves a hoodie. Like I think hoodies are fly. Yeah. And also, you know, women are now dressing hoodies up and down. Like I could rock this with some leggings and some pumps now, you know, so. <laughs> I just felt like there is always something that you can, like a conversation you can create without even opening your mouth. And, and I, I love if I saw somebody with cutie and a hoodie on, like I, it would make me smile because I would feel beautiful. Yeah. So that was the whole, you know, the motivation to do that line. Okay. So, yeah. yeah. Now I'll make sure that, 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 that link is, I, I guess the question is what's, what are pumps? Cause I always remember BBD saying, don't forget the pumps. Heels, shoes, the lettos. Oh, so that's, wow. Why would they call them pumps? They, I would, yeah, okay. That's all. Okay, okay. I was like, okay, pumps. Don't forget the pumps. Okay, so you, oh, so you mean like high heels. Okay. So they, we call them pumps. <laughs> okay, okay. That's, that's good. I, I didn't want to just go search on Google. I said, well, might as well ask you. So. Yeah, so they're just high heel shoes. High heels. Okay, so that makes sense. I always end my interviews by asking my guests that if you were stuck in an elevator and it says, look, it will take about three hours, but while we're waiting, we'll put a movie for you. What movie would you request? Oh, man. Ah, a movie. Oh, Sparkle. Oh, okay. Which one, though? The original Sparkle. Oh, the original one. Okay. Yes, because that is so many messages in that story. Mm. So it would definitely, um, definitely be Sparkle. Okay. And it's one, of, seen it? Yeah, no, no, I, um, yeah, I've seen it, it's, but it's been a long time. Um, so I wouldn't have, and this is before I love music. So I've Go seen it. The original Sparkle. But it taught me a lot. That movie taught me a lot that, it, and, it, and it taught me a lot about life because sometimes people have to die 
for somebody else to blossom. Yeah. And that is hands down one of my favorite movies of all time. Wow. Wow. What would be your favorite song of all time? Oh my gosh. Favorite song? Really? You want to do this to me? Yeah. I asked everybody about the favorite song. <laughs> oh my gosh. Favorite song. Mm. Now, well, it, it, okay, I have to say this. A gospel song that I love that actually changed my life was this song by Dorinda Clark Cole, one of the Clark sisters, and it's called I'm Still Here. And that was basically my testimony wow. when I was a lot of the dark times or whatever. Wow. I always refer to that song when I feel like I'm, I'm going into a certain space and, and that song kind of gives me reassurance that that God is, is who he is all the time. Yeah. Yeah. But that It would definitely be that song. Wow. I know, know before I used to ask if you were stuck in a, if the elevator was about to play the movie, what song would you put? But it, I just realized it's best to ask you what your favorite song is and stuff. Um, but you mentioned her being uh, um, an artist that you're, you're fond of who's out today. Um, a lot of us have a lot of my audience aren't really into anything after 2000 because it seems like that you know there's Jasmine Solomon um Ari Lennox there's there's a lot of female artists that are now but some of us feel as if they sound too similar and not as distinctive as back when you guys were out and even the material they're singing about are almost the same um you know um as somebody who's been in the industry for almost 30, for about the 30 years, what advice would you give to up and coming artists, R&B artists? One piece of important advice that I would definitely give them, like I've run into great, amazing singers all the time. And when I asked them, I said, well, well, who do you sound, who would you say you sound like? And some of them say Beyonce and, some of them would say, um, you know, Tony Braxton or whoever they say, they always end up sounding exactly like them. So when the song is over, I say, you are dope. You can really sing. But now let's hear what you sound like. Mm -hmm. You don't need to sound like Beyonce because we already have one. Mm -hmm. We already have a Tony Braxton. We don't need another one. What do you sound like? And I think that's the hardest thing for a lot of artists to do is find their voice. Mm -hmm. You know? So it would be that. Find the musician and the singer in you. Don't think you have to sound like everybody else. Don't think you have to do what everybody else is doing. Study music, all kind of music. Mm -hmm. Not just music that, uh, not just R&B, study pop, study uh, folk music, study music, look, study the top Billboard Top 100. Find mm. out why the songs are top 10 and some songs are not. That's what I do. You gotta do your homework. Yeah. <laughs> and then hire a lawyer to look after your, look after the list. <laughs> On track, do not get too happy about nothing. Don't get happy about the popping of the champagne. Yeah, it's exciting because you, everybody want to be the one that's chosen. Mm -hmm. But this is called show business. Mm -hmm. And actually, it should be business show because the <laughs> business is always going to come first. Mm -hmm. And business in this business is not always fair. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, I have to appreciate your time. I mean, Every, you know, Woody from Drew Hill, um, Crazy Bone from, it all said the same thing about the business sound. Even Pamela Long from to um, Formerly of Total, they all said the same type of things. And we've all been educated 
and inspired by 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 your by your story and, and stuff and uh, yeah you know i definitely appreciate the time you know it was probably spent almost two <laughs> more than two hours and i know you shouted out 90 minutes i'm gonna cut you off because i gotta do another um I got to judge something on Clubhouse tonight. Okay, no, no. As I said, I, I, I that's yeah, that. But it, but it, it's been, it's been, it's been, it's been great. And I know that we, as I said, um, we'll make sure everyone understands, sees your book, because um, the title might be, you know, the title was really, really took my took my eye. But it's, but hearing your story, it's good that we can get more in depth, um, and hopefully, lifetime will will definitely put something together for you guys and stuff. But, you know, I'd be thank you for being, being, being such a sport, but also being a supporter. Cause as I said, I've, I've seen you, seen mm -hmm. you looking at a few of the shows and, and stuff. So I appreciate. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I do. Cause you know, I'm fans of a lot of people that you interview. So I'd be wanting to know about them too. <laughs> you know, I'd be wanting to know, but, um, yeah, but keep keep doing what you're doing. And we watching you. We see what you're doing. Oh, I appreciate it. Doing, you know, keeping this timeless music alive. And I love it. I really like it. And that's why I, I gave you the interview. You were very patient. <laughs> and I reached out to you about something and you didn't even question it. You took care of it immediately. So I, <laughs> I gave you everything that you wanted and more. Thanks for watching. Please remember to subscribe to the channel, but most importantly, to press the notification bell so that you can be notified when we do have a new interview. Loads to come, but thanks a lot for watching.